Um, we are here talking about hydroponic mastery 101, simplifying the science of hydroponics. We all know that uh, getting started can be tough sometimes. We've got uh, Dr. Pat Warabaugh with us on the interview. Uh, Dr. Warabaugh, welcome to the call. Thank you very much. It's great to have you, and, and we just want to start off really simply with, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about your background and uh, about what you do. Okay. Uh, actually, for uh, uh, high school, for bachelor's, uh, I didn't even work with plants until I finally got to my master's degree. And uh, it wasn't until after I finished my Ph.D. that I really got into uh, working with hydroponics and greenhouses. I came to the University of Arizona in uh, 1990, and I've been here ever since. Um, I have been teaching teaching for about the last 10 years, an introductory class in hydroponics and an advanced class as well during the, during the school year. Wonderful. Okay. So now your students that you have right now, um, what have you found that they're looking for when they're, when they're joining your department and coming there? What, are they, what kind of information are they looking for nowadays? Has it, has it changed over the last few years? Well, actually, uh, a lot of the, the students that come to my class, um, a lot of them actually are, are coming from other other majors, uh, and they want to take a science elective, and this looks interesting, hydroponics, um, you know, how to grow your own food. Uh, other students, though, are actually in the plant sciences, um, ag and biosystems engineering, or even uh, ag education, and want to continue uh, in this in this field and use this information uh, later on in, in a work situation, either um, teaching uh, this this uh, in a high school setting, for example, if they have a, a greenhouse, um, working as a sales rep uh, in a company that perhaps sells um, piece parts to greenhouses or or uh, seeds, maybe working in a seed company. Uh, people, obviously, who uh, want to become growers themselves, either working for someone else or, or, or owning their own company. So definitely for a variety of reasons, uh, students are coming and, and taking these classes these days. Uh, it's really interesting because a lot of the members on our site uh, come from so many different backgrounds. Uh, you know, same thing. Some want to go into commercial. Some just want to, you know, grow something in their closet and just have mm -hmm. fresh lettuce for salad. So it's really amazing that they're coming from so many different standpoints. Um, right. So, well, there's a lot of people these days too that that just want to learn how to grow locally. We actually have an extension program here with uh, volunteers that that are from the community, uh, and they want to learn how to uh, um, grow healthy, unpesticide coated um, uh, produce in their own backyard, and and know where it's coming from, and and knowing know how it's grown, and locally grown food is becoming very important. So you're seeing an increase, you've almost in the last few years seen an increase in people's interest and curiosity for not only hydroponics but agriculture uh, in general mm -hmm. uh, for mm -hmm. safety and a number of different reasons. That's pretty fascinating. Okay. Sure. So mm -hmm. so some of the, let's say that um, some of our listeners and the, you know, the people you w work with who are brand new to hydroponics, never grown anything in their life, how would someone like that get started in your opinion? What's the easiest way to get going? Well, obviously, the easiest way to get going is to come to the University of Arizona and take some of our classes or <laughs> take our short course that we have in April. But um, certainly, if, if you can't come here um, uh, on the web, there's a lot of information now. In fact, at our website, um, uh, you can go on, and, and uh, I have my manual, class manual, for Plant Science 217 at the University of Arizona. And uh, you can actually look through uh, the entire uh, class manual. Um, 
certainly there are stores now coming, uh, you know, all over the country that that, that are uh, uh, there to hopefully help people. Although sometimes um, maybe their their uh, uh, workers are are new to this as well and and may not have as much information. Um, but there are a lot of a lot of stores around that, that do have a lot of uh, good folks out there that that can help you uh, get started. And uh, then all the books, uh, if you want to go the old-fashioned way, um, there's a lot of good books out there that, that people can use. Um, what, what would be one of your top recommended books, just as, a, as an example? I'm sorry? What would be a top recommendation on your end uh, for a book? What's the, the, the first book they should go get? Um, oh well, there are several out there. There's there's some that are are just small little manuals. Uh, some of the folks in in uh, uh, Australia have produced uh, uh, some some good uh, little little books that that just touch very uh, briefly on on um, some you know some of the main topics. Uh, Dr. Howard Resch uh, has has kind of the bible uh, of hydroponic food production, and it's uh, I have the sixth edition that may be up to the, the seventh or eighth edition by now. Uh, so so that, that would be a possibility. Uh, we actually wrote, I was talking about the class notes, we actually wrote um, uh, this, this series of class notes because it covered all the aspects that we wanted to and in the order that we wanted to present them in our class and as the plants grow because in our class it's very hands-on. We not only have lectures but we have the students working in the greenhouse uh, on plants at the same time perfect that is that is that is good news for uh, the people who are trying to get started thank you for that um, yeah there's there's one other there's there is one other thing and that is um, kits uh, some people say you know go to a store and and purchase a kit if you know what the plants need if you know a little bit about plant science and what the plants need, light, water, nutrients, how much, uh, when, um, then you can actually build your own systems for relatively an expensive amount of money uh, out of things like buckets and PVC pipe and, and even soda bottles and, and styrofoam cups. But definitely you need to know a little bit about the plants in order to be able to create the proper environment and the proper growing system for those plants. Excellent. So, so really, um, somebody just coming into hydroponics can. There's a, a multitude of ways for them to get started that are pretty basic that can be done right in the home. They don't have to have a big fancy lab or um, any any really large technology like what you work with, right? They can get started pretty soon within maybe 48 hours. Oh, absolutely. In in fact, uh, we I have my regular teaching greenhouse where we're presenting to the students uh, a commercial style system to grow high wire tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, that kind of thing. We have a second greenhouse, we call it the demonstration greenhouse, where um, we have simple systems made out of things like buckets and PVC pipe and, and soda bottles and, and cups and things like that that is actually maintained by our volunteers specifically for us to be able to then take people into uh, and show them simple systems. People that might be students uh, from a school want to set up a simple uh, classroom demonstration, teachers, uh, backyard gardeners where you may not want a greenhouse even, but you want to do it. You don't want to have to dig into the ground with your caliche bar. Um, people from other parts of the country may not may not be familiar with caliche, but um, it's it's also called hard pan. It's it's pretty typical to the desert areas. And uh, unlike some parts of the country where the very loamy soil and very rich and wonderful um, here, it's really hard to to get that first garden started and, and to grow anything other than native plants uh, unless you make a real effort at it. With hydroponics, you don't even have to dig in the soil. You just put your bucket down, fill it with some perlite, and you've got a growing system. So um, some people just want to have to be able to have a, a backyard garden without having to dig in the soil. And, and hydroponics is a perfect way to 
to do that. Wonderful. That that is great news for a lot of people listening. So, well said. Um, well, let's let's get into some more, even more specifics. Um, so, you know, every sing, everybody seems to have different ways to plant seeds and transplants. From your experience of teaching and growing in desert climate of AZ or you know Arizona where you are, what is the best or easiest way for hydro uh, hobbyist growers to get plants started in any growing system or crop? For actually, for yeah, for for actually any for any uh, a system, whether you're doing um, whether actually whether you're planting in the soil once you get the plants going, uh, or whether you're planting into any kind of hydroponic system, uh, bucket um, nutrient film technique that's called NFT floating system, any of these different systems. Um, one of the easiest ways is to just go out and buy yourself some of the little six ounce. Uh, uh, styrofoam cups, um, poke a few holes in the bottom with a, with a pencil or a pen, fill it with perlite, which is a material that, that it's actually a, a, a puffed rock, a rock that is mined, uh, put into a furnace, heated up, it, it actually puffs up into little balls, has a lot of good air space in it, um, and it can hold uh, a water and wick water very, very easily. So perlite in a styrofoam cup with some holes in the bottom, and you've got your little uh, beginning um, uh, germination chamber, essentially. Plant your seeds just accordingly to the, the directions on the packet. Um, typically, we put the, the cup then in a pan of water. Um, you can put some nutrient in there, but it's easier for the seed to germinate if it just has water. You could put just a little cover of saran wrap over the top so that it keeps the seed humid okay, and moist. But once that seed starts to germinate, then take that saran wrap off and then give it some, some fertilizer. And uh, with the fertilizers, that's, that's one expense that you, you really need to make, uh, one purchase, and that is hydroponic-specific nutrient. And you can get that in a variety of ways, either liquids or or um, uh, powders. Liquids or powders. So when you're talking about nutrient solution, just to, to probe a little bit more, what are you know? Do you have a couple in mind that you recommend people? Let's say growing tomatoes. Well, actually, what what you're going to have to do is you will have to go to a a. Um, a store that specializes in hydroponics, or you can go online, and there are a variety of stores that, that do online uh, purchases around the country now. Uh, so if you don't have a store in, in your area, just go online uh, and and find a store that's, that's closest to you. Uh, hydroponics, uh, hydroponic uh, uh, nutrients, uh, you can Google all kinds of different uh, uh, things that you want. Um, and so, uh, and I don't want to plug anyone any one store because there's there's uh, uh, many throughout the country, and and you just need to find the one that's, that's closest to you, uh, and and then they will actually they can make recommendations, um, and there are a lot of good fertilizers that are just almost like Miracle Grow, where you take a teaspoon and you add it to a gallon of water and then pour it into your system and you're and you're set. Um, but don't use Miracle Grow because, for example, here in in Arizona, I was talking about that hard pan, that caliche. Well, that's very very much uh, calcium. So we have already a lot of calcium in the soil here. Uh, and if you look at the Miracle Grow that is sold here, it doesn't have any calcium. And so if you're trying to do hydroponics with miracle Grow, calcium is one of what we call the macronutrients. It's needed by the plants in large amounts, and so it's needed in the nutrient solution in large amounts. And if you just add water and you're in a part of the country that, that doesn't have a lot of calcium in, in your water, and then maybe you buy something that, you know, miracle Grow that doesn't have any calcium either, you may, you may be uh, having calcium 
deficiencies. So you really need to purchase um, a, a hydroponic specific nutrient, and that's that is going to be probably, if, especially if you you know go the styrofoam cup and and that that route, uh, that's going to be your your biggest expense. I'm really glad you said that because I'm sure a lot of people would have just gone out there and, you know, they've seen the commercials for miracle Grow and it's kind of a household name and they would have gone out and used that. So that's why we do these interviews. That's why we've got the experts like you on here telling us how to do it right. So uh, well said. Uh, we're, not even ha- we're not even all the way through the interview and we've already simplified the science of hydroponics. <laughs> you're, you're, doing, you're doing an amazing job and I wanted to, you know, you, you talked about that's one simple system. That's a really basic way to jump in. If we were to take that mm-hmm. one step further, let's say there's some people that, you know, they, they've done that. Okay, they get it. Um, for different growing systems, which one would you use if you were just starting out and wanted to grow, you know, uh, a few different crops in your in your house? There are a lot of different kinds of systems. Um, obviously, uh, uh, floating systems, NFT, air gap, aeroponic, uh, and one that that really sort of does it for everything. I would think would be a bucket system. And when I say a bucket system, um, you take a five-gallon bucket or maybe a three-gallon bucket. You drill a hole about five to six inches up from the floor. You fill it with perlite, and you can add a little a little thing uh, on the side. Uh, you can put in a PVC pipe if you want, just vertically, just stand it up in the bucket before you put your perlite in. Uh, and then you can use a, a piece of dowel just to stick down there to see what your what your uh, solution level is. But if you make that hole about five to six inches up from the floor. Then you put your nutrient solution in and any of the overflow will just come out that hole. If it's not overflowing, well, you better add some more. What we're trying to do here is is create an air gap system. And we're also, this is also an aggregate system. Now, there, there are two ways of, of looking at, at a hydroponic system. One is, is it, are the roots hanging in an aggregate? Are they actually growing through something like, like perlite or vermiculite or peat moss or something like that? Or are those roots actually hanging into uh, just the nutrient solution itself? If they're hanging in the nutrient solution, we call that a liquid system. If they're, if they're growing through a, uh, some kind of aggregate, we call it an aggregate system. And I like this, this bucket. You can, you can have a bucket just filled with a nutrient solution as well obviously with no holes in the side but um, but this aggregate system allows you to grow all kinds of things uh, because it's a five gallon bucket it does have a lot of root room a lot more space for nutrient solution in there and so you can grow the taller crops such as tomatoes peppers cucumbers but you can also um, grow smaller crops Crops like spinach, lettuce, and herbs like basil, that kind of thing. And you can, because it's an aggregate, you can also grow what we call the root crops or tuber crops like carrots and onions, potatoes, beets, and things like that. So that kind of bucket system is is very versatile, and, and you can grow just about anything in a in a five gallon bucket. Now I've I've got a couple of questions. I just want to really specify um, some of the some of the words you used, um, like like perlite. What is that? Mm-hmm. Can you break that down for us? Perlite is a material that you can get just about anywhere, um, any hardware store, any of the big box uh, box stores um, like Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, in their nursery section, you can you can find uh, perlite either in small bags. You can get it just in a little gallon uh, bag, or you can even get a big uh, four cubic foot uh, uh, bag. And what it is, it's it's a rock that. That is uh, crushed and then heated, and each of the little particles actually 
pop almost into almost like a popcorn. Uh, it has a lot of air spaces in it. That perlite, it, it is white, uh, and it and it will have a lot of air spaces, but also a lot of space to hold the water and the and the and the, the nutrient solution. Uh, so we here we find that perlite works really well. In other locations, you might want to use something like coconut core, which is crushed up outer husk of the coconut uh, fruit. Uh, some people use, uh, they find that, that vermiculite and peat moss are a little bit better combinations. So it, it may, uh, you know, you may find that, that uh, other materials, other aggregates might work uh, in your area uh, better than, than perlite does. We, we find here that, especially in the summertime, we need to have lots of air space because the roots need to have lots of oxygen and those air spaces allow for uh, even in the hot weather the, um, the oxygen to get down into the root zone. Perfect. All right, that that explains it a lot better. Now, I'm gonna I want to kind of take a quick side step before I go on my next question. Uh, we had an interview with uh, Dr. Dixon De Pommier, and he was talking about we were talking about sustainability and you know everything green. Have you you mentioned PVC pipe? Um, has it ever have you guys ever come across anybody um, doing hydroponics using uh, bamboo as opposed to PVC? Um, I haven't, but that certainly doesn't mean that that. Uh, that it's not a viable solution and, and actually um, we're starting to look at a variety of different alternatives uh, to plastics uh, in fact um, even in the greenhouse industry and in the commercial side of things they're coming up with compostable clips and, and vine twine and things like that uh, to make it uh, more sustainable more, uh, more eco-friendly Excellent. I, th I think that's important for us to talk about, especially for people beginning, so so mm -hmm. that they can go into it green conscious and sustainability conscious. Obviously, those those uh, biodegradable things, um, especially right now, may be a little bit more expensive than the plastics. Although, as time goes on, sure. uh, I think they will become uh, more affordable, and and obviously, uh, more and more people, if they want, you know, if more and more people demand them, then then uh, the price will come down, and and uh, uh, and something like uh, uh, bamboo, um, you know, obviously we don't grow a whole lot of bamboo here, but uh, maybe that, that's uh, something that, that could be a sustainable alternative to, to um, uh, PVC pipe, things like that. Perfect, perfect. Okay, um, so if you had a choice of tomatoes, lettuce, and cucumbers, which would be the easiest to grow for a beginner? Okay. Well, my thought there is that it really depends on location. And that's environmental. So I'm talking about high and low temperature throughout the year, relative humidity, uh, and also the pest pressure. Uh, some places have lots of white flies or spider mites or things like that. So let me just go through the pros and cons for, for each one. Lettuce uh, is definitely a cool weather crop. Um, and for example, here in Tucson, Arizona, if you try to grow lettuce outside, either it doesn't germinate, it germinates and almost immediately bolts, uh, goes to flower. Um, it, it just does not do very well here in the summer. One trick that we have uh, uh, learned here uh, over the years, um, actually Dr. Merle Jensen uh, uh, and, and others uh, a few de several decades ago uh, discovered this, um, that if you cool the lettuce roots, uh, you can actually get lettuce to grow in fairly high temperatures. So if you are in a warm area and you want to grow lettuce during the summertime um, and you're in a, a home situation, for example, an easy way to, to do that is to use a, a floating system uh, where you have a styrofoam board that is just floating on the top of the, the nutrient solution. And you you have a couple of, of um, water bottles 
You fill them up, put them in the freezer, and in the morning you take one out, you put it into your your water, your system there. The water from the water bottle is not going to get out into your nutrients, not going to to uh, dilute it at all uh, because you have your cap on tightly. And that's going to keep the solution cool during the day. You take that out in the afternoon when it's when it's thawed, you put the other one in. You put the first one back in the freezer again. This is an easy way to keep the uh, the water cool, or the nutrient solution cool, and the roots cool so that the lettuce plants don't bolt so quickly. Another problem with, with uh, lettuce, and of course in the wintertime here, it just grows great. It's, it's wonderful. Um, we do get down below freezing, but the lettuce uh, just comes right back. It's, it's almost like pansies here. Um, they, they just come right back once the sun comes up. And, uh, and so in the wintertime, lettuce is very easy to grow here. Another problem with lettuce is aphids. Uh, and uh, this is an insect that, that will get right down in the crown and, and cause uh, some, some problems. Um, but they, they're not there in the wintertime. And, and the fact that lettuce is a very short duration crop, um, probably you won't have that much problem. I mean, if you do have a heavy pest pressure, you, you may have to to uh, really watch uh, uh, white flies and aphids and spider mites and things like that. Uh, that's why ch choosing your location or making sure that there aren't any, any pests uh, nearby is, is very important if you're going to have a backyard garden. That's lettuce. So great in the wintertime, very few pests, short duration, cool temperatures anyway. But if you want to grow it in the summer, you can you can uh, uh, modify the environment a little bit um, to grow it. Tomatoes, um, most of the time people in their backyard are going to grow bush tomatoes. Um, and uh, in in the greenhouse industry, we actually grow vining tomatoes. Uh, but if you're going to be growing tomatoes out on your back porch uh, and you don't have the support system that we would normally have in the greenhouse, get a nice bush tomato that uh, is from your local nursery. That that is, um, uh, and of course they're selecting the the appropriate varieties for for your area. Uh, maybe get a tomato cage. Um, again, using the bucket system, you can you can uh, grow your bush tomato. It's going to be very bushy. You just reach through the tomato cage and, and harvest your your uh, tomatoes. Watch for white flies, however. Um, white flies love solanaceous plants. Uh, tomatoes, peppers, uh, lots of different things are in the the family Solanaceae, and white flies love these plants. So you may need to spray with either uh, some oils or some um, uh, soaps, or even uh, get some beneficial insects, um, and that's that's a whole other discussion. But uh, white flies would be a, a concern uh, with tomatoes. Cucumbers, very prolific, but very prone to white flies, spider mites, aphids, powdery mildew. Um, any of the cucurbits, you want to make sure that they are powdery mildew resistant. Uh, um, and even then, you're going to have problems with the insects and the mites. So cucumbers, a little bit tricky. Um, tomatoes, probably your easiest. Just watch out for for some some uh, insect problems. And then lettuce, you know, if you can control the the temperature, um, that that would be th those would be the pros and cons to each of those three crops. Wonderful description. Now, I want to take you back to what you first said, and that was location, uh, mm -hmm. you know, depending on the location. Uh, are there any um, calculators that you know of or tools to help people determine, you know, what would grow well in those areas? Um, hmm. Maybe there aren't any out there. I just want to see if you know. 
I don't. I don't really know of anything. Essentially, what you need to to know is um, uh, uh, what your local environmental conditions are. For example, if you're not going to be using a greenhouse, you can you can grow anything that you would normally grow in a in a soil garden in hydroponics outdoors during that time of year. Uh, if you're in the snow belt, you're certainly not going to be growing during the winter time uh, without a greenhouse. Uh, if you are in the southeast where the humidity is very high much of the year, uh, it's very difficult to cool. So when you're talking about tomatoes, for example, or even lettuce, lettuce would be difficult to grow um, if you can't bring the temperature down. Tomatoes also have a problem with high temperature, and that comes, uh, for example, um, if you have high humidities, you cannot cool in a greenhouse very easily uh, with with a high humidities. If you are not in a greenhouse and you have high humidities and high temperatures, and then you're then you're at the mercy of of the natural environment. Tomatoes have a problem in that their pollen is very sensitive to temperature, and anything above about 85 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, the pollen. Um, may actually not be as good and and uh, uh, may die uh, before fertilization occurs. So then you would be wanting to grow something like a bush tomato. The bush is going to actually make its own microclimate within the bush itself. It actually makes a cooler situation, uh, and so you would not um, see more many many flowers on the outside. You'd see all the flowers and the fruit developing on the inside because the plant itself is making its own microclimate um, uh, to cool things down so that it's more appropriate for the for the uh, flowers. Uh, so so really that that location. Um, you know, a lot of times people will, will call from such and such a place and they will say, well, what's the best crop to grow? And what we have to do is we have to look at what kind of system they want to use, if they want to grow outside or in a greenhouse, how they'll be able to cool or heat depending on time of year. And really, what uh, uh, then, then we can make a determination as, as to what crop is going to be best. Uh, one of our local growers here, just as an example, uh, here in Arizona, uh, chose the location that they were going to grow uh, by the the uh, temperature, the the average temperature throughout the year that would be perfect for tomatoes. And so, but of course, a lot of home growers, their home is where their home is, and uh, they can't go off and and purchase another piece of land at, at a more ideal uh, location. Uh, and then that's that's when you have to decide well. I'm in this location, what would be best? And then we have to take into account all those environmental factors and and whether they're going to be in a greenhouse or not, et cetera, et cetera. Sure, sure. So that was one of the best breakdowns I've heard on tomatoes, lettuce, and cucumbers, by the way. Oh, okay. So, well, great. No, the pros, pros and cons were, were, were wonderful there. And I want to, along with that theme for lettuce, tomatoes, and cucumbers, what do you need to do in terms of maintenance? I mean, you've covered a little bit, but for pruning and supports, clips, thinning, et cetera, what, what do you have to say mm -hmm. about some of that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, first of all, with lettuce, um, if uh, usually the lettuce head, no matter whether you're looking at romaine or or the leaf lettuce or the head lettuce, um, anywhere between eight to twelve inches apart is going to be a good a good distance for for these plants. So if you plant 
uh, these little plants at anywhere between 8 and 12 inches on center, uh, then you can, you don't have to change anything, you don't have to decrease the spacing, you don't have to, you know, pull anything out. Uh, you can just let them grow up and fill in the space uh, and just let them grow. Uh, obviously, they need the proper temperature and, and that kind of thing. Lettuce is very uh, simple, very quick, um, and and that would be the easiest, really no maintenance once you get them started and, and put them in the system, just let them grow and, and, uh, and then harvest about 30 to 35 days later. Tomatoes and cucumbers, a uh, little bit more. Uh, now, if you if you choose a bush tomato, you can just let the the bush uh, sprawl. Same with with cucumber. Really, if if you just get a, a vining cucumber that you want to just let grow along the ground, you can just let it plant it and let it grow. Um, or as I mentioned before with the tomato, you could put that into a tomato cage, uh, water with the hydroponic specific nutrient solution daily and harvest. Um, with the vine tomatoes, there's a whole system of, of um, it's called high wire. Uh, you've, you've got the uh, stems uh, pruned to a single stem. You don't have any side shoots coming off, so, so stem pruning and stem clipping are very important. Also cluster clipping and cluster pruning are important and you do that on a on a weekly uh, basis uh, to to maintain a standard number of fruit per cluster. Uh, also leaf removal, uh, leaning and lowering, another thing because those vines keep growing up and up and up and they finally get to that, that overhead support cable. So we have a special kind of hook that we have our string tied onto. Uh, we unwind some of that string, lower the plant down, move it over. It's called leaning and lowering. Much easier to describe, I'm not sure, but uh, I try to uh, mention that anyway. Um, and then, of course, uh, harvest at least uh, once a week on, on the, uh, the vining tomatoes. Cucumbers, a uh, little bit different. Um, uh, this, the cucumbers can be, can be trained simply up a string and then just allowed to fall back down. Um, typically though, the, the vegetative portion of the plant, and we have vegetative and reproductive portions of these, of these fruit bearing plants. So, and with lettuce, of course, all we're doing, all we're working with is the vegetative portion. Tomatoes and cucumbers, we have a vegetative portion and we have that, that reproductive portion. In cucumbers, the vegetative portion tends to not really grow as quickly as the reproductive portion. Tomatoes tend to spend, oh, maybe about uh, 7 to 12 leaves. They put those on first before they try to put on a cluster. That allows them a lot more um, uh, photosynthetic area so that they can actually support this cluster and growing this cluster. Cucumbers tend fruit almost immediately. And so what we tend to do is remove fruit from the first, oh, mm, almost up to two and a half feet up from the base. And then once we have several big leaves there that will support fruit set, then we start allowing uh, usually about one fruit to set per node, and that's, that's where the leaves are coming out. Now in the winter time when the, the sun is lower, we might go every other node just because there's not as, as much sun, not as much photosynthesis going on, not as much sugars being made to fill those fruit. So then we would uh, just go maybe one every two nodes. And then harvest uh, one to two times per week. Excellent. Wow. You pretty much covered it there. Um, so let's, let's say we've, we've, uh, we've, we've discussed, you know, the kits, um, a starting, uh, a very easy starting point 
for uh, for most people. And then kind of a secondary system. We've talked about perlite. We've talked about the the different um, uh, vegetables to grow. Let's say someone's got them growing. It's working. The crops are going. What do you look for to keep growth in balance to maintain vegetative vigor and uh, fruiting and fruit development? Well, that's that's sort of what I was touching on earlier about um, uh, the vegetative versus reproductive growth. It's very very important in in tomatoes, for example. Just just to use those as an example. Um, Sometimes, if if we're if we're going along and and it and it uh, we've we've got our fall class and then we we come to uh, the the uh, holiday uh, vacation, a lot of the students leave, and 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 so all we have time to do is lean and lower and maybe do some some pruning and things like that of of the stem, but maybe people forget to prune the clusters, and I've seen even on a beefsteak tomato, I've seen as many as 14 fruit on one cluster whereas we typically want to have anywhere between three and five big beefsteak tomatoes on one cluster and when you allow a cluster to set so many fruit like that it becomes a huge sink for water for nutrients for all those sugars and it basically robs the clusters that are trying to set above that location so that you might have this huge cluster and then the next cluster up you might not have any fruit set all the fruit might actually abort the next cluster up you might get two or three fruit and then the the next cluster above that you might get back to a regular set but if you don't maintain a balance there and cluster pruning is that's why I was saying cluster pruning is very important uh, to maintain a constant number of, of fruit on each cluster, uh, so that you don't you don't have this imbalance. And it's of course important to to a, a home gardener, but certainly much more important to a commercial gar- uh, grower who has told their market that they will have a certain amount of produce every every week. And suddenly, if if the entire house has uh, one one huge cluster on all the all the plants. 14 fruit and then the next week they don't have anything their market is not going to be very happy well you can think that the that the home gardener if if suddenly they have a a huge amount of fruit one week but then nothing the next week um, they they probably would prefer to have had a a pretty consistent uh, tomato uh, harvest so so even even for the home gardener uh, cluster pruning is very important other things that you have to take into consideration is um, are, are the various kinds of vegetative growth? Uh, we can't do much about the the roots. They're they're down in the in the uh, rock wool or perlite or coconut core or whatever aggregate we we are using, or even the soil. Uh, but uh, the top we have vegetative growth in the form of suckers that are coming out, and also uh, leaves that are on the bottom, and. And typically, we will t- once we harvest the clusters uh, at the bottom, we will also take off leaves. And typically, uh, on a tomato, for example, um, at the top of a vining tomato, the plant is growing about three leaves and one cluster every week. So we can assume that we are probably going to be taking off three leaves and a cluster every week and so in order to keep the plant in balance um, you want to keep in mind all these things the the suckers I I didn't get into that either the suckers we call them suckers they're these side shoots and we call them suckers because they're sucking nutrients away from that main stem and, and all the fruit that we're trying to grow on that main stem so taking off these extra leaves at the bottom, taking off these side shoots, um, uh, these suckers on the, the that are sucking away nutrients, uh, that helps maintain uh, the vegetative portion of the plant, and then also maintaining uh, proper uh, fruit count on your clusters, uh, so that you have a consistent harvest uh, throughout. Uh, 
the, the time is, is very important as well. Now, I did mention three to five on beefsteak. You can go, if, if it's a smaller uh, TOV, which is called tomato on the vine, uh, you harvest the entire cluster at, at one time. Uh, usually the fruit is somewhere between 50 and 100 grams, um, maybe a quarter pound or less. And and you might get uh, five to seven or eight fruit on, on a cluster of these smaller varieties. If you're going down to a, even a smaller variety, Variety, the cherries, uh, the mini plums, the, the grapes, you can have anywhere from 16 to 100 little fruit, uh, depending on what kind of variety you but again, it really depends on, on the, uh, the cluster and the size, or the variety and the size of, of the fruit of that variety. Pat, this is Matt, and that was incredible. I, you know, I wish that, uh, you know, that uh, my growers uh, understood growing as well as you did in, in soil-based systems. But next question is, you know, on the nutrient level, uh, as far as nutrients, do you have to change during any particular time of that, of that growing period, you know, from the beginning? Do you, do you do anything different from the start to the end, you know, on those crops? Well, with lettuce... Um because it's in for such a short time, uh, you can add full strength hydroponic nutrient solution, for example, to to a tub, uh, uh, and and then have your system either floating or a styrofoam board over the top and the and the roots hanging down. And you all you may have to do is is maybe every week or so just just add some nutrient uh, to to that. Uh, but again, that's only four to six. That, that you're going to have the, the lettuce in, in that system before you're harvesting. So, so that's a really quick crop. With things like the tomatoes and the cucumbers, the tomatoes, for example, can use, when, when it's a mature plant, the tomatoes will use upwards of a gallon of nutrient solution a day. Wow. So... In that case, you'll want to be adding nutrient solution every single day uh, if you have, for example, a bucket system. If you have something like a, an automatic watering system, um, we call it a fertigator system. Uh, we're fertilizing and irrigating at the same time. Uh, then, then we would be adding a specific amount of nutrient solution uh, at every watering. And, and we would have it set so that we would be adding that water. Um, typically for a home gardener, uh, you just get your, your watering can and, and um, uh, top off your, your bucket uh, system so that, so that you've, you've got the, a little bit of nutrient then coming out that five to six inch hole that's up from the floor. Uh, so, so the nutrients, uh, in that case, you, with cucumbers, peppers, tomatoes, those are fairly large plants. They're going to be in for a number of months, and you just keep adding to your bucket system. You just keep adding, and, and the plants will use, use that, uh, use that uh, water and, and the nutrients, and then you just keep refilling it every day. Perfect. Thank you, Pat. That's that's exactly what our, our listeners are looking for because that's one of the questions that we get asked a lot is, you know, how much should I put in? Is there a rule of thumb? But I think, like you said, just as if we're, we're putting in spoon feeding the plant, uh, that's probably the, the perfect way to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you set up your system properly in the beginning, if you're using that five-gallon bucket and you, you drill that hole about six inches up from the floor, uh, then that's going to give you the proper amount of water that should be in that bucket. Note that, the, that there'll be a, a saturation, a complete saturation below the level of that hole in the bucket, but the, the perlite above that will be more Moist, but not saturated, and that's where the oxygen can get in to feed the uh, to feed the roots, which of course need water, nutrients, and oxygen. And those are those are kind of the three big ones too, Pat. I think that you know even soil based uh, growers miss that a lot. Is it uh, you know that that uh, oxygen is a such a vital component on your bucket system? Just you know, just so I have a visual. 
Uh, basically, you just put a bucket in there with a can um, that you keep filled up with a PVC pipe down in it, right? So that it acts as a float. Is that kind of what you're referring to? Well, you don't even have to put in the PVC pipe if you have if you drill that that hole in the side that's about six inches up from the floor, uh, because the PVC pipe is is just a way to stick a, a dowel down in almost like a dipstick uh, to see how much uh, water that you have in your bucket. But if you have a hole drilled in your bucket about six inches up from the floor, uh, then then that's that's your automatic. Uh, uh, leveler, uh, even if you keep adding nutrient solution from the top, um, it'll just if it if it reaches that that hole, it'll just start flowing out that hole. So in that in that case, you will never be able to overwater your plants. I did have a problem one time when when we left for vacation and we had somebody come in and and take care of, of the plants and and uh, uh, I. I did not have a hole in in that particular bucket, and they kept watering it, and they kept watering it, and they kept watering it, and pretty soon it started dying, so they kept watering it some more because they thought that maybe it wasn't getting enough water. And of course, what, what was happening was that the the plant was not getting enough oxygen, and the roots were dying. And so they just kept watering it until two weeks later when we came back, the, the poor plant was dead. and. Well, had to start over again. (laughs) (laughs) And that's why we're here, Pat, you know, because that's what I think a lot of people experience. And that's what we're trying to prevent is, you know, we want to make people successful. uh, That's right. So we really appreciate your time and your expertise because uh, I think you've laid this out incredible for us and our, our listeners. Uh, for them to get a really good uh, start on, on how to be successful at, at hydroponic growing. All right. Well, and if anybody has any questions, um, give them my my uh, website and and uh, email, and and I'll try to answer some more questions. Well, thank you for that. We're actually going to do that, and then I, I wanted to have kind of one last uh, final final thought from you, and then um, we are uh, we'll just have a couple other comments. So the last one is, you know, what is your final advice for anybody um, becoming a beginner, uh, just getting into hydroponics? What would be you know something that you've learned in your past that somebody would like to know? I think that the most important thing is to first learn what the plants need, and that is light and water and nutrients and the proper temperature and and uh, relative humidity and the proper support system. Um, learn what the plants need. Oh, and of course the carbon dioxide and oxygen. Uh, because then you will be able to actually build a system and place your system in the right location so that your plants will grow to their optimum. Perfect. That's that is wonderful. Now, now, you know, as far as the future goes, what are you going to teach your students about the future opportunity for hydroponics? Oh, future opportunities for hydroponics. I think really there's there's um, as as we we uh, try to feed more people with less and less arable or or good uh, farming land, uh, we're going to have to become a lot smarter uh, uh, with how we grow and what we grow and how we grow it. Um, and I think hydroponics it, it's not going to save the world. And we've got we've got a few other problems that we need to solve. Uh, the, before that, but um, uh, growing especially uh, uh, vitamin-rich, nutrient-rich uh, uh, produce, lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, and all the herbs, even medicinal things like that. We really need to to uh, be able to grow those, and, and we can using hydroponics in a fairly small area, um, and even in in backyards. So, so I, I think that's that's really 
um, you know, we're not obviously in, in hydroponics or greenhouses going to be able to to uh, help out with with things like corn and wheat and sorghum and and other other uh, grain crops, um, but certainly with with these other high cash value crops uh, on a commercial level and then all different kinds of crops uh, yeah, at the at the home gardener level. Um, that's that's where that's where we're going to be able to make a, a big a big dent in the future. Well said. Well, we've gone through quite a lot here on Hydroponic Mastery 101. I, I think we definitely delved into simplifying the science of hydroponics. We could probably spend five more hours with you, I'm sure, with all the knowledge <laughs> you have. Uh, you know, well, that's, you that's why they should come and, and take my class, right? <laughs> it, exactly. Now, now, I heard you have, you have a new short class coming out. Is that true? Well, uh, the Controlled Environment Ag Center at the uh, University of Arizona, uh, on a yearly basis, does a short course. Um, we have been doing them in January. However, this this past year, we we uh, started doing it in April. Uh, and they can go to people can go to our website. Uh, we have the new information up about the the next short course, which will be next April, uh, in Tucson, Arizona. Here. Uh, uh, April or May, uh, we, we may actually go to the beginning of May, uh, and uh, it's about a three and a half day uh, workshop uh, where we have lots of, of uh, speakers uh, and uh, tours. Um, so a lot, lot of uh, hands-on uh, learning how to do different kinds of things, and a, and a lot of information, um, a, a lot of uh, uh, lectures, and, and things like that to get some of the basic knowledge as well. Okay, and on our on our video version of this, we're actually going to post all that information for people so that they can get your website. Oh. But can you tell us exactly which website uh, that you that is your most important one that you'd like to share? Uh, actually, the uh, the website for for the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center here at the University of Arizona is http colon slash slash www dot ag ag okay dot Arizona spelled out dot edu slash C E A C slash. And let me just say that again. It's ag.arizona.edu slash C E A C, and that stands for Controlled Environment Agriculture Center. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, we've been here with Dr. Pat Rorabal. We've had a wonderful time. We've covered a lot of information. Thank you so much for your time. We really value uh, your knowledge. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Take Thank care. You. Okay. Bye.